In the study of microeconomics, we stated that one of the important branches of microeconomics is the study of consumer behavior. So this less, from this lesson onwards, we shall uh, look into this consumer behavior and try and understand the various laws that govern the study of consumer behavior. So as usual, we will use PowerPoint slides to uh, present the subject. The first law in the study of consumer behavior is that of the law of diminishing marginal utility. Consumption can be examined from two perspectives. One, the macro perspective, which is known as the aggregative uh, study and that is known as consumption function. The second one is the expenditure aspect of uh, consumption from a consumer's point of view and we study it in microeconomics. So this lesson is on the microeconomic aspect of consumer behavior. Now we will be uh, look, uh, presenting some new terms and terminologies here. Let me start with the term utility. How do we define utility? What are the different forms of utility? And what are the laws that have been developed on the idea of utility? The first and foremost, utility as a concept can be defined as the want satisfying power of a commodity. Now that means it is the expected satisfaction of a commodity. So even before a consumer actually buys a commodity or he consumes a commodity, the consumer expects to get some benefit out of that commodity. And that is what is termed as utility. Utility is subjective. It depends upon the internal state of mind of the consumer. It is introspective, which means the consumer can uh, examine, analyze it for himself, whether he is getting the utility that um, he is expecting and then take a decision. Utility is, of course, different from usefulness. Now, when we talk about usefulness and uh, utility, uh, the consumption of alcohol, for uh, example, does it seem to be useful to a person? That's really a question. But the thing is, it possesses utility for the person who is willing to spend money on getting him a drink or her a drink. So utility is not the same as usefulness and utility is not the same as pleasure. Uh, you could also think about this person who has to have a bitter medicine. Now, bitter medicine does not give the consumer any pleasure. But the fact is that the consumer purchases that commodity and uses it. So it is not necessary that utility gives pleasure to the consumer. Then utility does not have any moral significance in the sense that there is nothing wrong and right about utility. It is value neutral and utility depends upon the intensity of the want. So when we feel a want very intensely, then the utility can also be uh, different from another situation when we did not so strongly want, uh, want to be satisfied. Now, having understood this uh, idea of utility, utility is a driving force or the motor force as Marshall said, it is a determinant of decision making and it provides sufficient reason for decision making in the sense when a consumer wants to buy something or wants to consume something or wants to acquire something, the guiding factor behind all of that is his calculation of utility, his mental calculation of utility. 
Now we have another concept here, the types of utility. It is very uh, conventional to uh, teach these terms to a student who is learning economics for the first time. Now what do we mean by types of utility? It is just that we categorize utility can be created in various ways. The first one is called as form utility. Form utility is easy to understand when we say a, a piece of uh, wood is converted into furniture. In that case, the conversion of the wood into furniture is called form utility. Utility can also be created when we change the place of a good. For example, if we take the produced goods from a factory and bring it to a shop for sale, then we would say that uh, there is place utility which is created because the utility that it had in the factory is uh, different from the, uh, the utility that this commodity had when we brought it to the shop. The other kind of utility can also be because we have uh, made uh, something available at the right time. Example, um, raincoats and umbrellas or woolen clothes uh, during the uh, needs of the season. Uh, so if we get raincoats and umbrellas during rainy season, then it has created place uh, time utility. And we can also provide service to people when they are in need and thus create what is known as service utility. Now let me uh, quickly take you to the origin of this idea of utility. Now this idea is uh, uh, dated back to uh, Jeremy Bentham and uh, with Jeremy Bentham we say that uh, he talks about two important words in the entire study of uh, under his understanding of society and economics. He talks about pleasure and pain. He says that all that we do, all that we think and all that we say is driven by pleasure and pain. So we like to avoid pain, all human beings according to him like to avoid pain and they like to get pleasure. So all activities that we do are driven by the goal of pleasure seeking. From this idea came what is known as utilitarianism and this utilitarianism set the uh, ground for understanding this idea of uh, satisfaction that we get when we consume something. And uh, his important question was, what is the use of something we do if it does not give pleasure to people? And that has become the cornerstone of all policies that even now the governments will have to make. Now this was the origin of this idea, but then we also related to um, Henry uh, Gossen. And what Gossen did here was, he connected it to, uh, he developed that idea into something called as diminishing marginal utility. In the sense, he introduced two words, diminishing and marginal. And the third thing that he did was, he developed this uh, graph that we so popularly use now, but it dates back to 1854. So it's more than 150 or odd years that we have got this idea developed. And uh, here he does not use the word utility, but he uses the word magnitude of satisfaction. Now it came to, there were other writers also in between like Leon Walrus and uh, others, but here I am coming to Alfred Marshall. Uh, uh, Alfred Marshall gave it its uh, present form. He polished the ideas of Gossen and uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham and he said that the pleasure occupies the previously uh, uh, place held by a want. That means when we have a want, it is a sense of deprivation. Now when we uh, satisfy the want, that want is replaced by pleasure. And he gives his interesting example in his book. He talks about um, a thirsty person. So thirst is a want and when this want is satisfied by drinking water then that want or deprivation of water is now converted into something pleasurable that he likes. And, util and according to Marshall, utility can be measured and utility can be measured in terms of utils and in terms of 
money. So money is the measuring rod according to uh, Marshall. Now, we come to another two sets of new terms here, cardinal analysis and ordinal analysis. Now, before I go to explain the law, let me just, words, let me also tell you that every subject that you study has got a series of words which belong to that subject. And that word is understood for developing further ideas in that uh, subject. So here we have utility. Now we have come across the different forms of utility. We are now coming to two new terms, cardinal utility and marginal, cardinal and ordinal utility. What is ordinal utility, cardinal utility? Cardinal utility is when we um, can count the utility, which means uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. We can count the numbers, we can understand the magnitude of the numbers in comparison to an earlier number. Now, the other one is called as ordinal numbers. In this case, we can't measure the magnitude except say that the first may be bigger than the second or the second may be bigger than the first or something. We can only rank the utility but we cannot measure utility. It is like telling here is a boy who came first in the class and then we do not know how many students were there in the class. The magnitude cannot be measured. So these are the two terms cardinal and ordinal analysis which has been borrowed from the subject of mathematics. Now this particular presentation will only um, present or based on cardinal analysis. The ordinal analysis we shall do it later when we do indifference curve analysis. Uh, let's now come to um, uh, assumptions and satirist paribus. Now as I have explained earlier to you in one of the presentation that all economic microeconomic theories uses assumption. So without assumption it is difficult to explain a microeconomic theory because it itself is an abstraction of the real life and once we abstract the real life we make it simplified further so that we can understand the behavior of the variables we are studying. If we want to change the, uh, the size or the magnitude of one variable and want to see the effect of that on other variables we need to hold many assumptions. Assumption is simplification it is also to understand the effect of a change of one variable on the other. Now assumptions here satirist paribus is an important word satirist uh, yes satirist paribus uh, in microeconomic means other things remaining the same. In the study of mi uh, microeconomics, we hold many uh, things uh, remaining the same like the taste of the uh, consumer, the preferences of the consumer or the income of the consumer when it is not needed or the price of related goods when it is not needed. Depending upon the theory we are trying to prove, we may use the satirist paribus condition. The assumptions of the law of diminishing marginal utility. Now this is the law that we are trying to prove and it is also based on a set of assumptions. First and foremost we assume that this law is based on the cardinal measurement of utility as I just told you before this and that all units are consumed in suitable uh, size. Now what does that mean? Uh, if a person is thirsty, we cannot give a spoon of water to the person and then say that the law does not apply. So there is a suitable size for water which probably is a glass of uh, water and if a hungry person looks for food, we cannot say that we should be giving a mouthful of food and then say the law does not apply. So we need to give a sizable unit of uh, food on a plate so that the person's hunger can be satisfied and consumption should be continuous. It should not happen that we start eating uh, in the morning, then we stop there and then we eat something uh, say after four hours and then about eight hours and then they say that the law does not apply. For understanding the law, for the theoretical explanation of the law, we assume that the consumption of whatever good we are talking about is continuous. And then we also say that other things, their goods are also homogeneous. It should not happen that uh, uh, we are consuming something where uh, 
uh, one uh, the first cup was less uh, sweet and the second unit was sweeter and third unit was less sweet so no so all the units that we are going to consume should give the consumer the same taste now that means goods must be homogeneous in nature and satirus paribus is uh, valid here it means all other influencing factors will remain the same like the price income taste preferences of the consumer now another two terms that i will introduce you to uh, one is known as total utility and the other is called marginal utility now these are very important terms in the understanding of this law to as we consume something we are assuming that the commodities consumption gives us some sense of utility so if we continuously have commodity at uh, the unit of consumption we will add up to get a certain amount of satisfaction by the uh, the sequence of consumption that means if you have consumed four we will get some total utility of uh, after consuming having four if we consume six units then we will get some utility after having consumed six units so total utility is the total amount sum total of all the uh, commodities and the utility that it gives to the consumer now sum total um, of utility also has a peculiar behavior it will uh, continue to rise till a point it reaches maximum and after it reaches its maximum the total utility will start diminishing so uh, total utility is a function of the total number of units that you have consumed and add up the total the add up the individual utilities for each unit of consumption let's come to this term marginal utility marginal utility is a little different from total utility in the case of marginal utility every unit of consumption gives us certain amount of utility now it is also observed that the as we consume more and more of this unit of consumption we will also find that the addition made to the total utility by this additional unit of consumption actually goes on diminishing now how do we understand this the first unit would give certain addition to the total utility the second unit that utility that we are getting from the second unit is not the same as the first but nevertheless we can add it to the total utility the third whatever the satisfaction we get or the utility we get we can use it to add up to the total utility this way we will be adding up all the units that we have consumed but each time the utility that each unit of consumption is giving subsequent unit of consumption is giving will go on changing so if we want to say this way total utility a marginal utility is total un utility minus one unit that means if you reduce the previous unit how much we have consumed what is left behind is known as the marginal utility now marginal utility is of uh, calculated at the marginal unit now what is the marginal unit the last unit that you have consumed is called as marginal unit if we have consumed three uh, three units of the commodity the third unit is a marginal unit if we have consumed four unit then the fourth is the marginal unit so this um, the last unit that we have consumed is known as the marginal unit now in economics as you go later you will find that this marginal unit is a very important term because many of the decisions that are taken in economics are taken at the margin so at this point a consumer may find it different or may not find it necessary to consume and he may take a decision to consume or not to consume so that is the importance of the term margin in marginal utility now let me give it to you in a simple uh, table in economics again in microeconomics uh, we use a lot of tables and graphs and that in some way it uh, helps you to um, abstract a real life and bring it to uh, the position where we can analyze it but more importantly i believe that um, this using of graphs and tables allows your intellectual skills also to develop so you develop analytical skills you are able to uh, comprehend a real life situation into numbers and then able to prove it so that is the purpose of using tables and to uh, graph to prove a point now let us look at this table here 
oranges again many of the examples that we use are very hypothetical may not work in, in real life but we imagine these examples so that we can prove a point we are trying to uh, say now in this particular case take the number of oranges 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 so we are assuming that the consumer has seven oranges now let us say how does this consumer uh, consume these seven oranges the first orange the marginal utility is the same as total utility because there has been nothing consumed before that. Now take the second unit. What has happened? The second unit gives the consumer only 8 utils. Now that is different from what we did just before. Before we said that it is 10 utils. Now the second unit, uh, unit of consumption is giving the consumer only 8 utils. So when we say 8 utils, what can we do now? We can calculate this in a very simple way. On the 10 original number, we add this util which was given to us by the second unit. So 10 plus 8 becomes total utility of 18. Now take the third one. Third one, the utility, marginal utility that you are getting from the uh, third unit is only 6. When compared to the 10 that you had earlier, the 8 that you had earlier, third unit gives you only 6. Now, where will we add the 6? We will add 6 to the 18 total utility which we got from the earlier two units. So, 6 plus 18 gives us 24 and you can go down the line like that. Fourth one gives you only 4 utils. Fifth one gives you only 5 utils and you reach a maximum of 30. If you observe this table, you will find that after 30, the consumer, if he consumes the sixth unit, the consumer does not get any additional utility. He gets zero. Now, when he is getting zero utility, then our total utility will remain the same at 10, at 30. So, 30 in the fifth unit, 30 in the sixth unit. Now, assume that this consumer has to consume the seventh orange also. If he consumes the seventh orange, what happens to him? This consumer will actually get negative utility or we get a minus value here. Now, what would that mean? The consumer has reached his saturation point and after reaching the saturation point, we are still forcing the consumer to have something and he may say, no, it's giving me negative utility. So there what we do is we deduct minus 2 from the 30, which was the maximum. So now our total utility is falling it has come down to 28 instead of becoming 32 so this particular table what you have seen is a very simple abstraction of uh, real life observation i'm sure you have understood the table would you like to draw this table on your own you could on the vertical axis you can show utility and on the horizontal axis you can say the number of units that you uh, you can consume those who want you can try that it's a very simple diagram you also understand how in economics these real life situations we have converted first into a table now we are converting into a, uh, a diagram we don't use graph sheet in um, economics most of them are only representation of an idea but here if you want to try because you are familiar with using a graph sheet you may use one but otherwise it is not necessary to use a graph sheet now what is that first uh, graph telling you the first graph tells you the utility is constantly increasing you can see that the curve is rising upwards so when the curve is rising upwards we say the utility is increasing and then uh, after 30 we remember that 30 yes after 30 the utility is becoming 28 and that is the point on on your uh, graph where the curve is actually showing a downward trend and then take the second diagram of marginal utility what do you say here the marginal utility was maximum at 10 and then you found that when we were consuming the sixth unit the consumer got only zero utils out of that and after that it becomes a minus two which is what exactly that curve begins so i'm sure that these two diagrams are very easy to understand you don't need to buy hard these two diagrams because if you have understood the logic of the um, the table and if you have understood the concept that i just explained before you will be able to draw this graph very easily
And now let us look into something else here. What is the relationship between marginal and total utility? I am sure by looking at the table and the graph, you were able to establish some kind of understanding. Again, in economics, many of these relationships are established where we talk about cause and effect or how one variable is causing a change in the behavior of the other variable. So this is very this is a very organic way in which you will begin you will continue your study of economics. So marginal utility continues to fall. In the table we saw that marginal utility continues to fall till such time it reaches negative uh, um, zero and then becomes negative. On the other hand, you also found that total utility does not behave like that. Total utility shows a continuous upward trend till it reaches a certain number. The consumer is saturated of that want. He does not want to have that commodity again. And after that, the total utility starts diminishing. So it reaches its maximum and then it starts diminishing. The point when it reaches its maximum, here the marginal utility will be zero. And once the marginal utility becomes negative, the total utility curve starts dropping. So that is the relationship between the two uh, curves. Now, there, are, uh, there is something that we can now observe from the idea that we talked about utility of Jeremy Bentham and uh, Gossen and Marshall. It is also called as Gossen's first law. You can compare, you can understand these things, then we convert it into a table and we uh, drew a diagram for that. From all of this, we observe something very, very uh, clearly. One is that on a given uh, item, the magnitude of pleasure continuously decreases if we continue to uh, satisfy this pleasure without interruption until eventually satiety is reached. That means if we continue to consume something without interrupt, that is very important, without interruption, not that we eat something now and then come back after one hour and say that the law does not apply. That's not how it is. If we continue to consume something uninterrupted then after some time the pleasure we get from that commodity will start diminishing because you have reached your uh, satisfaction maximum and you will not consume it any further this is also called as Gossen's first law now the idea Marshall makes it like this additional benefit which a person derives from a given increase in his stock of a thing uh, Gossen explained about consumption, whereas uh, Marshall explained about the stock of a commodity. Now, in uh, when we study utility, you can study in both ways. One is to understand the consumption. The second is to understand the stock. So when we have a stock of a commodity increasing, then also the utility that we get from that stock goes on diminishing. So anything that we have in large quantity, that utility of that stock is small. Anything we consume in large quantity, that utility what we get is small. It is like the, the, um, uh, telling that uh, Marshall gave this uh, example, uh, very interesting example. He says, if I had a piece of cake, whom would I give it to? I would give it to my wife. And if I had another piece, I would have eaten it for my, kept it for myself. And he says, if I had a third piece, I would give it to uh, somebody else. He meant his uh, mother-in-law. So as the stock increases, the perceived utility of that commodity, that stock also goes on diminishing. And uh, Kenneth Boulding connected both of them and he said both stock and consumption both affect, uh, the, both behave the same way. The marginal utility will continuously diminish. Now the question is why does this law operate? The law operates, we have to now find that. We have observed it but now we have to give a reason as to why does this happen. So we give two important reasons why this law operates. The first one is called the law, um, first one is known as the nature of wants itself. We say that all uh, want, human wants are unlimited but at any given time a particular want can be satisfied. So it would mean that when a person is thirsty, if we give him water, then the thirst want is satisfied. 
So these uh, these are it is understood that um, we can satisfy any one want at a given point of time. So if the we satisfy the want at one particular time, then obviously it means that we consume more and more units of that commodity. The marginal utility we are getting from that will certainly diminish. And uh, we also say the second reason is that goods are not perfect substitutes of each other. If they were substitutes of each other, we would have replaced water with uh, a glass of uh, juice. Now, if juice uh, is going to be had in terms in uh, instead of water, then the utility that you get for juice is going to be totally different from the utility that you derive from water. So we don't have perfect substitutes and uh, since the two goods are never perfect substitutes, it will always mean that any one commodity, whatever we have chosen, if you consume it over and over again, then the utility must diminish. Now there are certain limitations to the law. The first four, first uh, uh, two, the first two are uh, actually based on the assumptions itself, and we say that um, the change in uh, taste and preferences of the consumer will change, and we also say that uh, inadequate uh, initial consumption can also uh, stop a person from um, feeling uh, satisfied. And then it gives the, uh, we, we understand that if somebody buys something for emotional reason and it is not because of logic, because we believe that our economic person is a rational person. So rationality is behind all the study of uh, economics. The entire study is based on somebody who is rational, who is not driven by um, emotional status to take decisions. And then we say, and the miser. Now, will the miser go on saving endlessly? Will that happen like that? No, it won't because the miser too requires to eat and spend money on where he lives and so on. So it is not possible for the miser to continuously save though he likes to increase the stock. So the law of diminishing marginal utility is applying and that is the reason he is stopping, he, he stops his um, saving and he begins to consume. And also that of uh, uh, hobby collections or uh, rare uh, paintings and collections of that kind. It is argued that people who collect hobby or uh, have a hobby of collecting things, they, they will never be fed up of collecting things and the law of diminishing marginal utility will not apply. But that's not true because uh, in real life, no hobby collector will collect the same piece of item more and more. A stamp collector, for example, will collect different kinds of stamp, but stamps, yes. Uh, or a person who collects painting will collect different kinds of painting, but not necessarily the same painting. Why? Because the law of diminishing marginal utility is applying to uh, the person as well. Also, we talk about liquor sometimes when I ask this question in a class that do you or what are the example do you think that the law does not apply the immediate answer they give is one is liquor and one is money now let me explain this case of liquor if the liquor had not be begun to give uh, diminishing marginal utility to the consumer we would not have found the person who drinks to be senseless and lie falling off some way that means even for him the law of diminishing marginal utility has operated and as far as money is concerned we can very easily understand that what happen how do you treat money when it is in the beginning of the month when you have a larger quantity of money or your stock of money is more and how do you uh, value the money when the stock is less so when the stock is less you value the money more when the stock is more you money value the money less so this is how we understand uh, the uh, law of uh, diminishing marginal utility and uh, I remember this example that Marshall has given in his book about a boy uh, about taking a decision by using marginal utility he talks about this boy hungry boy who is in a farm and he says that the boy has to pick berries and has to eat so what will the boy do first so apparently the boy will pick up the berries first and uh, and then after he picks up the berry, he has to choose a time when he stops picking up berries and he starts eating. So that is the law. How long will you do some work and when do you stop doing that work and land up doing something else? These are the broader counters of the same idea. And is this law important? Yes, this law is very important. 
because it allows us to determine prices of commodities. It allows us in our day-to-day -day, uh, expenditure, uh, when do we decide how much to buy, then we can also take, uh, uh, it explains the following chapter on demand curve. You will find that the law of demand is based on this law of uh, diminishing marginal utility. It is used to develop uh, uh, consumer, other consumer related theories. It is also used by government in many of the public policies that they make. Uh, I hope this uh, law of diminishing marginal utility is very clear to you now with the concept of uh, utility, uh, types of utility, cardinal, ordinal numbers and then we have uh, spoken about total utility, marginal utility. We have explained with a table and a graph and then why the law operates. Now the last question is, I would want you to uh, question some things that uh, has been presented to you. You try and find out whether without the assumption also this law operates or does it apply for hobby collection? Meet a person who collects uh, items of, uh, you know, of stamps or paintings or some such thing, whatever they want to collect. Ask them, do they, uh, don't they feel the law of diminishing marginal utility operating for them? And you can also say, uh, will this law help you to make a better decision? when to stop eating or when to stop buying something, when to start, stop hoarding something. So these are the practical implications of the law. So if you have understood this law well, then you will be able to apply it in your day-to-day -day life. And of course, exams part of it becomes very easy because you have understood the law well. So enjoy learning economics. At the same time, share this video with your good friend and subscribe to the video. Um, it will be interesting for you to learn economics in a very systematic way, in a very methodical way. And I take the idea, one idea to the other, so that you do not get confused at any stage. So, happy learning to you. Please subscribe to the channel. The next chapter will be on the law of equi-marginal utility. Thank you very much.